my name is Jorge Carrillo, and this is my life story. Uh, I want to start at the beginning. My uh, mother's family, uh, her parents, came to the United States in the 1920s. They came by train and they settled in Los Angeles and Fresno area, primarily to work as farm workers uh, in those areas. My mother was born in Los Angeles in 1926. My, on my father's side, he grew up on a farm in Fruitaw, Colorado, which is near Grand Junction. And uh, he uh, volunteered for the World War II he spent six years uh, in the military, both with the Army, uh, Marines, and Navy. And uh, they met right after the war and got married and had three children, all sons. And I'm the youngest of those uh, three children. My earliest recollection is when I was five years old. My parents had bought a new house in a new development in, in Clovis, just a suburb outside of Fresno. And uh, I went to a brand new elementary school for kindergarten. At the end of the year, my mother wanted to uh, go to Mazatlan, which is what, where her uh, family is from, to visit for a month. And so she and my brothers and I went by bus to Mazatlan. My father stayed in Clovis working. Uh, we were there a month, and towards the end of the month, uh, my mother one day got a telegram, and she had a horrified look on her face. And she didn't tell us what, but uh, she that same day we took the bus and returned to uh, Clovis. And uh, I remember my mother sobbing uncontrollably in the driveway of the house that we lived in. There was a pickup truck, and a stranger was moving furniture into our home. And what had happened was that my father was having an affair. And while we were gone, he sold the house so that he could have money and elope with his new mistress. So he literally left us out in the street. So that was pretty tough. I remember uh, feeling an emptiness, a void in the pit of my stomach, which kind of lasted throughout my childhood. and still bothers me, still shows up, even as an adult. But because of that, we moved uh, to Fresno, and I went to elementary school there. About a year later, my father reappeared. Uh, apparently, his affair was over, and he wanted to get together again with my mother. And my mother was resistant, but she was of the belief that if you married, you married for life. And she also felt it was important for her children to have a father. So she eventually took him back. We moved to um, Tijuana and lived there for a few months. My father got a job uh, working in an aircraft company in San Diego. And so he carpooled with other workers who lived in Tijuana and uh, worked at the same place. And things went fine for a while, but Pretty soon, uh, he was up to his old habits. They would get paid on Friday, and so he and his carpool friends would go out to bars and drink and uh, patronize with other women. And so he started coming home uh, after midnight, having spent half of his paycheck. Uh, and then eventually, he would come home having spent all of his paycheck which was really difficult for us because we, were, we would run out of uh, money during the week, and there were days when uh, we just wouldn't eat. We just drank water from the faucet until uh, he got paid again or my mother borrowed money from a relative. So my mother made him move from there, and we moved to National City uh, so he wouldn't carpool anymore. And... Uh, my mother made a decision uh, at that point because she realized that my father was never going to be fa faithful to her. And so um, she made the decision that we would go to school uh, in San Diego. But as soon as school ended in early uh, June, uh, she would take my two brothers and myself and she would uh, travel to uh, Fresno. We lived in a 
small town called Selma, which is maybe 10, 12 miles south of Fresno. And the reason she did that was because she wanted to join her uh, parents, who were uh, farm workers in that area, and uh, work in the agricultural fields to earn money as an emergency fund in case my father ever abandoned us again or uh, he was unemployed. My father would stay behind. He, I can only remember one time when he went with us to work at Fresno. So he would stay in San Diego either working or looking for work if he was unemployed. And my mother realized that he was probably not going to be faithful, but she felt it was more important for us to have that emergency fund to protect ourselves should uh, something happen in the future. So starting at the age of seven, um, up until I was 16, every summer, as soon as school ended, we would uh, uh, go to Selma and start working in the fields. We had a routine um, of crops that we would work. Uh, first, we would uh, pick raspberries, peaches, and figs. And then uh, towards the end of June, we would go to Hollister, and there we would pick apricots and harvest garlic. Then we would come back to Selma, and we would work more uh, again in uh, peaches and figs. And then towards early August, we would start working harvesting grapes. And the bulk of our work was uh, the grape harvest. We harvested grapes for the fresh market, uh, for wi wineries, but most of what we did was pick grapes in order to make raisins. Our working conditions were pretty sparse. Uh, normally, we just pitched the tents in a field somewhere. We slept on discarded mattresses or cots, or sometimes if we couldn't find either, we would, we would just lay blankets down and lay on blankets. Uh, we had no electricity, so uh, we didn't have a refrigerator. We bought food that was packaged or wasn't perishable. And if we did buy um, perishable food, um, like milk and things like that, we would have a cooler with ice that we would put it in to keep it fresh for a day or, or so. And because we had no electricity, we had to go to sleep as soon as it became uh, dark. So a typical day for us uh, started between 4 and 5 in the morning. It was dark. Usually we got up and had some kind of breakfast. And then we would get in a, a truck or in a car and travel anywhere from 15 minutes to up to an hour to get to the field that we would be working with. Uh, normally we were working uh, even before the sun peaked over the horizon. And the reason we did that was because in Fresno, the temperatures get up to 90 to, to over 100 every day in the summer. And it was important for us to be able to do as much work in the morning because we were more productive when it was cooler in the day. But even though it got hot, we, we didn't take a break except to eat at lunch. We would continue to work uh, up until 5 o'clock every day. And we did that um, six days a week, uh, Monday through Saturday. Um, usually we took uh, Sunday, Sundays off unless the grower needed us to, uh, to work. And sometimes we work Sundays as well. But most of the time we just work Monday through Saturday. We worked a minimum of 10 hours a day. Some of the conditions we worked with were also pretty tough. Um, a lot of uh, the fields, especially in the grapes, uh, they had uh, nests of wasp. Uh, and so whenever we encountered that, we might encounter a wasp nest maybe every, every 15, 20 minutes. We had to roll up a piece of paper uh, and light it on fire and burn the nest out and then get in there. Uh, usually the wasp would abandoned the nest for about a minute or two, and in that minute or two, we would harvest the grapes from that particular vine and then move on. And we also had a lot of uh, black widows that we that loved the shade within the vines, and so we were constantly dealing with black widows. Um, I remember several times uh, smelling the residue of pesticides that had been um, 
applied maybe, you know, earlier in the week or something like that. And there were various times when the vines were covered with a white powdery substance. I'm guessing it was probably some type of sulfur uh, chemical that they would spray. And when you got into the vines, this plume of smoke would, would arise and you couldn't help but breathe it. One of my brothers got bit one time by wasp in his neck and he had to spend several days in the hospital because his neck swelled up and he was having difficulty breathing. And I had an adverse reaction to uh, some pesticides that landed me in the hospital for about a week. But in those days, um, it wasn't uh, unusual to find lots of families working in those type of conditions. So it was just kind of a standard thing. In those days, there weren't any toilets in the uh, fields, so uh, normally we would have we would have to find some uh, private place, either in the vineyards or in the orchards, uh, to take care of business. It was a little harder when we worked in row crops, such as garlic, where there isn't any trees and there isn't any sh vines. So usually we would have to walk to an adjacent field or drive to an adjacent field. Um, a lot of people ask me if. You know, that was uh, a hardship if working in the fields was, you know, something that I regretted having to do. And and uh, it was tough. I'm, I'm not going to mince words. It was a lot of hard work. But um, but I think I, I became a better person uh, because of that experience. And there, there, there are three lessons that I want, that I learned from that that I want to go over. The first one is that I learned the value of hard work. And to this day, um, I wake up whenever there's any kind of light uh, getting through the windows. And I get up and I start working because I do my best work in the morning. I also learned the value of an education. A lot of my cousins who lived in Selma dropped out of, of school by junior high. They just didn't see any future for them other than working in the fields. And um, my mother had had to work, had to drop out of uh, school in order to help the family uh, when she was young. So she didn't want us. She didn't want us to uh, miss out on school the way she did. So um, our cousins and our families would make fun of us uh, when we left. We, when we would leave at the end of the harvest. And they would say, why are you going back to San Diego uh, to go to school? Uh, are you going to show the grower your diploma when you enter the field to work? And so they would laugh at us. But uh, my mother um, was uh, adamant that she wanted us to go to school, so we would always go back. And the third thing I learned was uh, the value of em empathy. Because when I was growing up in Fresno, um, there was a lot of racism. There was a lot of discrimination. If you were Mexican, you know, uh, or if you were a farm worker, you were sort of treated as if you were in the lower, lower um, tiers of, of society. And there's one in incident that I want to recount because um, I was eight years old at the time and uh, we were working uh, harvesting grapes for raisins and um, in when you do raisins, in between the rows, they put some sandy material that's compressed so that you can put paper and then you can put the grapevines on it and have the sun uh, dry the grapes into raisins. So um, a lot of times we would get, we would be on our hands and knees and we would get dust and dirt all over our clothes and all over our face and all over uh, our hands. And with the hot temperature, uh, you would sweat, and so the sweat would mix in with, uh, with the dust, and you would have streaks of mud kind of on your face. So one day we were going home, and uh, we needed a carton of milk, and so we stopped at a roadside grocery, and um, everybody stayed in the car, but I was asked to go inside and uh, buy the carton of milk, so I was given a dollar. So I went in and got the milk from the refrigerated uh, compartment, and then uh, there was only one cashier um, at, at the takeout counter, 
And so there was a line of five or six people that were waiting to uh, pay for their groceries. So I was about maybe the fifth or sixth person. And as I was waiting in the line, I heard this gruff voice behind me say, they ought to put him and his clothes in the washing machine. And so I turned around and there was this elderly couple that were looking at me with disdain. And I remember my cheeks flaring up, being very angry, but I was just a child, so what could I say to them? I didn't say anything. But when I went up to the cashier and um, I paid, I gave the cashier my dollar. And she was in her early 20s and she got her, she got the change and she had it in her hand. And I reached out my hand to, uh, for her to give me the change. And she just stared at me for a few seconds and uh, didn't give me the change. She just turned her hand over and let the coins fall on the counter and they rolled around and I was shocked and embarrassed by that. I used my hand to scrape the coins together off the counter, but the dust on my hands had mixed in with the condensation on the milk carton. So it just left streaks of mud on the counter. And I remember running uh, out of the store crying. And when I got into the car, I told my grandparents and my mother that uh, I was never wanted to go back into that place again. And I thought they were gonna go in and complain, but they didn't say anything. They just started the car and we left. And I think they just um, felt that that was the way life was and there was nothing to complain about. And I often remember that story because the irony of the situation doesn't es escape me. Here people were going into that grocery store to buy food that people like myself were harvesting under pretty harsh conditions. Um, and they were okay with buying the food, but when they saw the condition in which I was in, uh, that was where they drew the line. And they didn't have any empathy or compassion or understanding for me. And uh, so that taught me that um, now, whenever I see people that are doing work that is a benefit to me or to the general public, I always try to show appreciation and respect and uh, understanding for whatever situation they're going to. That was a big uh, impact on my life. Um, another impact that, uh, that affected me in my childhood was that my father was germaphobic. And he had certain rules. Uh, those rules were that we couldn't touch him. Uh, I remember one time I was sitting at the kitchen table and he was sitting next to me and I got up and I accidentally brushed my knee against his. And he jumped up and he had his fist like this ready to strike me and he was screaming and yelling and I was just kind of cowering and he was screaming that I was never to touch him again. And needless to say, I remember that I never touched him, uh, that I can recall. He had the rule that we couldn't, um, we couldn't go out and play with other children because if we did, uh, they might want to come over and he didn't want them to be coming into our house. So uh, my two brothers and I, we never really played with other children. We rarely visited family, uh, relatives. If we did, um, the few times I remember, my father would take a newspaper and when we went inside, he'd lay this newspaper down on the sofa or the chair and he'd sit on it. Um, if he saw relatives that were coming to visit us, parking in the front of the street, he would quickly close the door and um, pull down the shades and then uh, order us to be quiet. And the people on the front door would be knocking on the door saying, we know you're in there. We saw you pulling down the blinds, let us in. But he wouldn't, he wouldn't open the door. Every once in a while, somebody would uh, surprise us and uh, they were at the door knocking while it was still open and my mother would let them in. And, my father, to my surprise, would be very gracious uh, about it, but uh, once they left, uh, he would go into the bathroom and he would lather up his hands 
and we would go to the places where they were uh, sitting and uh, we'd start touching them, sort of going through a, a cleaning ritual to try to, uh, to try to sanitize, I guess, the area that they were sitting. sitting. So uh, I never wanted anybody to come over to our house because I never wanted them to, to witness that kind of behavior. The other thing was that we never went out, so we never went to the library. I didn't grow up reading at all, except uh, what, what was required in our uh, school classrooms. And the other thing was he was a strict Catholic, but he never liked going to church, so I grew up without ever really going to church. I knew very little about the Bible or about you know the, the religious traditions of the Catholic Church. When I was um, 15 uh, and I was in the 10th grade, uh, my father was still with us. And um, I remember in October, uh, one of his brothers who lived in Ogden, Utah, um, got him a job at an air aircraft uh, factory that was there. And so my father left in October and the plan was that he would get settled into uh, working in, uh, in this uh, city, Ogden, and uh, he would find a place for us to move. And at the Christmas break, we would go to, to join him. And I was not thrilled by that at all. I had grown up in California, and to me, Ogden, Utah sounded like it was some foreign, foreign country. And I was going to leave everything that I knew and go to a brand new place in a brand new high school. December came around. My father said, well, I'm, I haven't found a suitable place for you guys to come. So uh, give it another month and then you can come. But what happened was that in January, uh, a sheriff came to our door and served my mo mother with divorce papers because he had met someone in her, in her early 20s. And he wanted to marry her and had to divorce my mother. And my mother, uh, bless her heart, wanted to go to Ogden, Utah to contest the divorce, but my grandparents uh, talked her out of it. And so um, just to close the book on my father, he lived another 37 years and I never saw him again after he left us in, in the 10th grade. He married twice, he had, um, five children, uh, all sons, so all together he had eight children. And he passed away in 2002, but um, I remember in 2002, we got a letter from a social worker who told us that he was had terminal cancer and he only had a couple of months left to live and someone from his family needed to go to Utah and take care of his uh, affairs. and. Uh, Nobody went. He died by himself with no family surrounded him. And that just told me that he didn't treat his other families uh, any better than he treated us. So I felt a, at that time, I felt a great burden off of my shoulders. It was the first time that I felt that maybe I could live a, a life without having some kind of onerous pressure hanging over me. So. That was the end of uh, my father's story with me, or relationship with me. Attention deficit disorder runs through my family. My father had it, I have it, and one of my sons have it. And I struggled uh, in school with that, uh, with that because I had difficulty uh, reading, and I had difficulty um, when I listened to teachers or professors uh, giving a lot of fact, facts all at once. Uh, I was very easily distracted by things or perhaps uh, as the professor was, was talking, I'd start concentrating on one aspect of what he said and I'd kind of tune out to the other things he was saying. So I had to learn uh, on my own um, how to develop uh, coping mechanisms to focus and stay uh, stay on top of the material that I was expected to learn. And I was able to do that on my own, uh, and I got good grades. So the net effect of all of what I 
uh, have previously discussed was that I was very isolated when I was growing up. And I felt different. I felt I was different than all the other kids that were in school. I, I thought they knew a lot more than I did because I was very sheltered. And um, I was afraid that if I opened my mouth that they would discover that I was very ignorant, that I didn't know very much. And as a result of that, I became very withdrawn to the point where I wouldn't speak uh, hardly to anybody. And if you meet somebody that met me in either high school or in college, uh, that would be the first thing they, they would say is that I hardly ever said anything about any everything. And that was just a, a lack of confidence on my part. Um, I remember I started having panic attacks because I was afraid every time a teacher or a college professor would start asking students questions, I was certain they were going to ask me, and uh, my heart would start pounding against my chest, my throat would constrict, and uh, I just spiraled uh, in anxiety. Um, and. 99% of the time I was never called, but uh, the ordeal of going through that anticipation just paralyzed me for a long time. I worked in the farm work until I was uh, about in the 11th grade. Uh, we stopped working in the fields because my older brother was accepted to UCSD, and as part of that, his admission, uh, he was offered uh, the opportunity to attend a college readiness program that was given in the summer. And uh, so my mother decided that we wouldn't go to Fresno, that it was more important for him to uh, take that class. And so that was the first summer that I didn't go to work in the fields. And then the following year, I applied to UCSD and uh, I was accepted, and I also attended the same uh, college readiness program. So what I remember from my time at UCSD was I was admitted to Muir. This was in 1968. Um, it was the first time that I was away from my family, so uh, it was a new experience. And uh, for me, it was a time uh, to meet new people. Uh, I met various people that, that were of different backgrounds than me. But I remember realizing early on that I had a misconception. I had said before that I felt different and that people uh, knew much more than I, I did. And what I discovered uh, living with other people and talking to them was that that everybody has challenges, that it wasn't at all unique. Maybe my circumstances were unique to me, but it wasn't unique that other people had difficulties and challenges that they had to overcome. And that was sort of very refreshing to me to realize that. I met friends that are still friends with me today. And I also met my wife, Raquel. And Raquel was the oldest of 10. She grew up in Imperial Beach, and she spent a lot of her youth helping her mother take care of her, uh, of her siblings. And so her life was uh, similar to mine in the sense that she didn't have much of a social life outside of the family. Um, so um, that kind of bonded us together, and while we were at UCSD, we sort of together uh, started experiencing uh, aspects of life that we had never experienced before. One aspect that really um, we really enjoyed was that we had a meal plan when, when we were at UCSD, and we could go have breakfast, lunch, and dinner. There were a lot of foods that we had never eaten before, things like pizza, macaroni and cheese, Asian food, uh, hamburgers, and things of that sort. And uh, we were so enthralled with the food that not only would we have breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but there was a grill on campus that was open till 10. And so uh, we always went like at 9.30 at night and we would order cheeseburgers, fries, and shakes. And we couldn't get enough uh, of that. 
Well, needless, needless to say, uh, we both gained a lot of weight our first year to the point where we realized that we couldn't keep doing that. And we started to exercise. Um, there's a little field by Muir that's next to the swimming pool, and we would go every day and we would run two or three miles around that field. Uh, the field's still there. And that was a, a habit that was really helpful to us because we started running just for recreation. And uh, to date, we've run over 90 marathons and over 150 half marathons. And every day we run or walk seven miles. And it's just something we enjoy doing. At the same time, there was a lot, uh, it was a time of enlightenment enlightenment at UCSD. Uh, the civil rights movement was occurring. Uh, the protests against the Vietnam War was occurring. There was more focus on social justice and equality for, uh, for minorities and women. So that really opened up our minds and shaped a lot of our opinions. Um, and we decided uh, that we for careers, we wanted to do something that would be for public good. So my wife, Raquel, um, graduated and she went to UC Davis to get a teaching credential. And she worked in various uh, low-income minority communities uh, teaching bilingual education or immersion. She worked in Chula Vista, in Daly City, and in the Sacramento area. And I decided that um, I wanted to become a lawyer. When we were growing up uh, and we had difficulties, we never had access to uh, a lawyer. And I felt that uh, the law would, would teach me how to, how to become a lawyer and would also help me kind of with my confidence because I was, still, I was still very withdrawn at that time. So I applied and I was accepted to go to Stanford Law School. And uh, I was there from 1972 to 1975. And uh, I, grad I graduated and took the bar and passed it. And um, one of the things that happened was in 1975, there was a new law, new state law that was uh, enacted called the Agriculture Labor Relations Act. And just to give a little bit of uh, historical uh, background on that, in 1935, Congress passed the National Labor Relations Act that gave workers across the country the right to organize uh, and have a union uh, negotiate for wages and working conditions. But uh, the senators from the South, uh, whose districts were primarily agriculture, didn't want to include farm workers. So to get their votes, uh, agricultural workers were excluded from the coverage of the national law, labor law, and it was left up to the states as to whether they wanted to have a state law to protect farm workers. There were a few states that had some kind of minimal labor laws, but none that were co as comprehensive as the national law. And that changed in 1975 because um, Cesar Chavez and the United Farm Workers in the late 60s started uh, organizing farm workers uh, to strike at, in order to uh, get the grower to negotiate with them over wages and working conditions. And uh, that didn't work too well. So then the UFW, um, along with the Filipino uh, workers, uh, they started uh, going to uh, the stores that were carrying, for example, the grapes of uh, the growers that they were striking and uh, put pressure uh, on the public not to patronize those stores. So those stores were unhappy about being boycotted. And so ultimately in 1975, after it was... Uh, some instances of violence in the fields. Um, Governor Jerry Brown got the growers together and the United Farm Workers together, and they agreed to have a comprehensive law that was modeled after the National Labor Relations Act enacted in California for California farm workers. So it just so happened that the law opened up 
right at the same time that I had finished taking the bar. And so uh, I knew some of the people that were um, being recruited to, um, to work for the ALRB, Agriculture Labor Relations Board. And so I started directly from law school uh, working at the agency. And uh, the thing that struck me about working for the ALRB was that um, it was a new law and it caught the uh, imagination of the excitement of farm workers. They saw it as uh, a way that uh, it affirmed their dignity as human beings. And they saw it as a way for them to uh, negotiate uh, better wages and better um, working conditions to the point that it would benefit their children because their children wouldn't have to drop out of school in, uh, in the middle school um, in order to help the family earn enough wages to live on. And so they saw it as an opportunity to let their kids stay in school and hopefully go on to higher education. So in the first five months of the operation, uh, we, ha we had more elections uh, in California in those five months than the National Labor Relations Board had uh, in its first year of operation throughout the United States. And almost all of those elections were won by the United Farm Workers. So it was a very exciting time to be there. My job was, um, because, uh, because a lot of the growers were not prepared for the law, um, they didn't really understand it. And so a lot of them uh, would fire workers who were, uh, farm workers who were uh, supporting the United Farm Workers. And my job was to uh, file a complaint and have a hearing to try to get those workers reinstated and back pay for any time that they lost. So I ended up litigating uh, the first five years to protect uh, the rights of farm workers to organize and, uh, and uh, have a union. At the end of the five years, uh, there's a five-member board that, um, that administers the ALRB, and they were located in Sacramento. Those board members are appointed by the governor, and they have to be confirmed by the state senate. The board uh, asked me to become its chief legal advisor and administrator, and so I did that uh, for about two and a half years. I moved from San Diego to Sacramento. And at the end of my two and a half years, there was a vacancy on the board, and um, I applied for it. And by that time, I had gotten to know uh, Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta, and so they, they were supportive of me, and they asked the governor to appoint me, and he did. And uh, they also lobbied the state senators to have me confirmed, and that was a that was an uphill battle because uh, at that time, Jerry Brown had a poor relationship with the legislature, both Democrats and Republicans, and so he had appointed various people to the board, and they had all been rejected. They had not been confirmed. But I was the first one to be confirmed uh, for after a couple of years of no, no, uh, nobody being appointed and confirmed on the, the board. So for me, uh, working for the ALRB was uh, probably my most meaningful work in my legal career because um, it was sort of a completing the, the circle uh, in that I was working as a farm worker and my goal was to help other people in the same kind of situation that I was. And I was able to do that by working for this agency. After I worked about 11 years for the ALRB, I ended up working for the state uh, attorney general's office, uh, enforcing the hazardous waste laws and protecting the environment. So that was another uh, meaningful work from for me uh, that I felt was in the public good. And then after I did that, I worked 22 years an, as an administrative law judge for the Unemployment uh, Insurance Appeals Board. And those were hearings that were uh, conducted in order to determine whether unemployed people or disabled people would get unemployment benefits or disability benefits. And so, again, that was another work that I saw was uh, helping uh, people. Towards the end of the 22 years, uh, I was asked by the board to be its chief administrative law judge in charge of the appellate operations. So, 
So that was uh, an honor to be able to serve in that uh, in that uh, position. So I retired in 2010, and um, now that I'm retired, I have time to volunteer, and I've been volunteering uh, with UCSD um, because uh, I want to help uh, UCSD in, very, in whatever way I can. And so I'm a member of the Chicanx Latinx Alumni Council. Uh, I'm co-chair of their uh, Student Outreach Committee. Uh, we, uh, those are activities in which we try to recruit uh, low-income uh, students to apply to UCSD and be admitted. And uh, once they're admitted, then uh, trying to mentor and support them here at UCSD. I'm also a member of the um, Chancellor's uh, Hispanic Serving Institute Task Force that is providing recommendations to the Chancellor and UCSD on how they can achieve uh, Hispanic Serving Institute uh, designation. And that's where if UCSD has 25% of its population, student population be uh, Hispanic, then they can qualify for grants from the uh, Department of Education to help support uh, students uh, at UCSD. And I'm also a member of the Chancellor's Community Advisory Board. As part of my uh, work for UCSD, I decided to establish an endowment um, that would uh, provide scholarships to students. And the reason I done that. Um, I didn't. I didn't earn that much money working for the for the state, but I was able to save a little bit. And um, even though it's my safety net, I, I really think it's important to to establish scholarships that help other people that have financial need. But there were two reasons why I did the endowment. The first one was that I was the youngest of three children in my immediate family, and all three of us uh, are UCSD graduates. Raquel, uh, my wife, is the oldest of 10, and all 10 of them attended UCSD. And then uh, Raquel and I have two children, and they're both UCSD graduates. So there's 15 of us in our immediate family that are uh, UCSD alumni. and. Um, so we have a lot of loyalty to UCS, UCSD. But the second reason I established the endowment, or my wife and I established the endowment, was because we both uh, received financial aid when we were attending uh, both UCSD as well as law school or, or uh, her getting her teacher credential. And uh, it helped us realize our educational goals and, and led to us getting meaningful jobs. And we want to provide that to other students who want to come to, an, to UCSD so that they can achieve their educational goals. And many of us who grew up poor um, or grew up in low-income uh, communities uh, we tend to remember that, and we go back and either live in the community or work in the community, or we find other ways to support the communities that we came from. And so to me, an endowment is an investment in students, but it's also an investment in our community because many of those students are going to give back to the community. So um, and an endowment is an annual uh, it's an annual uh, scholarship. It's not just a one-time scholarship that's awarded, but uh, every year there's a scholarship that's going to be given. So, so that just uh, appealed to me to do that. So as far as advice uh, to students who may be watching this, I'd like to give the following advice. Life is a continuous journey of learning, growth, and change. Apply yourself and learn. College gives you an important foundation in terms of knowledge and, skill and skills that you will use for your work, but also for your personal life. Don't be afraid of making mistakes or even failing. Making mistakes and failing is uh, one way 
to learn and grow as a person. If you have difficulties or mental health issues, the way I did back when I was having my problems, I didn't even know there were terms like AD and ADD and germophobia or panic attacks. And so I never got any help. Nobody talked about it back then. But nowadays, there's been a lot of research and much more is known and, and there are strategies that can help you overcome any, any issues if you have uh, learning disabilities, if you have attention deficit disorder, if you have panic attacks, if you're depressed or you have other mental issues. Don't be afraid to reach out and talk to someone, whether it's a friend, a family member, a faculty member, someone in an organization you're, you're part of. Maybe they don't know how, how to help you, but they can steer you in the right direction to where you can get resources to help you overcome any issues um, that you may have. The goal is for you to succeed. So be open, be hopeful, and be optimistic. So thank you for listening to my story.